You're listening to Local Bites, the podcast of local futures and the economics of happiness. In this series, we feature critical voices and inspiring examples from the global movement to resist corporate power, renew local place-based economies, and preserve human and ecological well-being. I'm Sean Keller. In this episode, we're going to have a chance to listen in on a conversation between Local Futures director Helena Norberg-Hodge and Wendell Berry, the acclaimed American poet, novelist, and environmentalist. So, Wendell, thanks so much for doing this. I'm really grateful to you for taking the time. Well, you're welcome so far, Helena, but don't be, be <laughs> grateful yet. Let's, let's see what we get here. A bit of classic Wendell Berry humor right there. Before we go any further, just a bit of background on who's talking here. Helena produced our documentary, The Economics of Happiness, and wrote Ancient Futures, a book about her experience in the traditional agrarian culture of Ladakh, or Little Tibet, and how that culture dealt with being exposed to the globalized economy. And Wendell is the author and co-author of more than 40 books, novels set in the fictional Kentucky town of Port William, nonfiction titles including The Unsettling of America and What Matters, Economics for a Renewed Commonwealth, which he wrote with Herman Daly, as well as collections of essays, short stories, and poems, including The Art of Loading Brush, which was just published last year. Wendell has spent his whole life giving voice to the small and local, and his works embody his deep affinity for rural living and his own experience as a small farmer. So as you might expect, the conversation starts with an appropriately light subject, the question of whether humanity deserves to exist. So many people are feeling desperate, really, very, very depressed. They're giving up on on humankind, and they they say things like human beings, they are just ignorant, stupid, and greedy, and we deserve to extinguish ourselves. That seems to me to be a cheap way out. Yes. I think that there's some merit to be found among us and some merit to be found in our history, our record. There's a lot of bad in it, no question about that. But the interesting thing is to try to solve the problem, not escape it. But and I, but I think also the big issue is to realize that the real problem is not human nature, but what I think of as an inhuman system. It's a, it's of a scale that's inhuman. So for me, one of the biggest problems we're facing is that it's become so big that we can't see what we're doing and what we're contributing to that has become like a giant machine, a a sort of a global juggernaut that's pushing us all into fear and, and a terrible sense of scarcity because it centralizes everything and creates this artificial scarcity of jobs. And I guess that's why we both really believe in human scale, so that human beings are at least able to see the mess they create. What one has to say to begin with is that as humans, we are limited in intelligence. And so none of us will come up uh, with answers to the whole great problem. What we can do is judge our behavior our history, and our present situation by a better standard than efficiency or profit or those measures that we're still using to determine economic decisions. The standard that I always come back to is the health of the world, which is the same as our own personal health. We can't distinguish our own health from the health of everything else. And we know enough from the ecologists now to know that the health is an ununderstandable complexity of relationships that makes the world whole. And insofar as it's whole, it's able to survive. It's also beautiful. And to subtract arbitrarily for merely economic reasons, any part of that whole is a great fault. By the standard of health, we have to be inclusive in our charity toward everything else. This is a kind of neighborliness, uh, and we have fairly good instructions about how to treat our neighbors. Our neighbors are not just our friend. They are our enemies and the non-human creatures uh, with whom we share the world. 
And don't you agree that when people are more dependent, you know, on the living community around them, both the human and the non-human, then it becomes obvious that their well-being is connected to the well-being of the other. It's in this long-distance system dependent on abstract ideas and abstract institutions where we don't even see our masters, the big global banks, etc., that we we move into a, a, a really a type of ignorance and madness. It seems to me that it all depends upon our ability to accept limits. And uh, the present economic system doesn't even acknowledge limits. If we acknowledge the existence of limits and the necessity of honoring them, it's possible to imagine an economy that takes care of the good things that we have in our immediate neighborhood rather than an economy that, as we say, develops resources, which is to say by development to turn resources into riches, which is to say money, which leads almost inevitably to destruction. Money is an abstraction. Goods are always particular and 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 always available uh, within limits natural limits and the rightful limits of our consumption. And in order for us to see those limits, we need more localized economies. But it would mean even more if we meant by economy the original sense of household management or housekeeping. Uh, That would imply taking the best possible care of first the household economy then the neighborhood economy, then the community economy. And we can go on from there on the principle of community if we take it to the sense of what we all have in common. But it will only be manageable locally and within limits, the limits, among other things, of our own intelligence and our own capacity to act responsibly. See, also what I've seen in in ancient traditional cultures is that even the language reminded people that their experiential knowledge was really the only reliable knowledge. So, for instance, in ancient Tibetan, you, you couldn't say, in my garden, you know, right now the apples are, are ripe, and then next sentence, talk about what's happening in China, you know, and say, in China it is like this. In the language, you would be forced to show that you'd never been to China and that you had heard second, third hand that it is said that it is like that. And so for me, one of the great tragedies and one of the great transformations has been this inversion of trusting second hand knowledge more than we trust experiential knowledge and in fact denigrating experiential knowledge, you know, as anecdotal and worthless. And of course this has been reinforced by, you know, the numerical, very reductionist modern science. Well I think what you're applying there is simply the fundamental rule of all the human disciplines. And the rule is that you have to know what you're talking about. You have to come with evidence. And this applies across the board, from the court of law to the laboratory of the scientist. If you make an assertion, you have to back it up with something you actually know and can demonstrate. And so we have to know the difference between knowledge and speculation knowledge and wistful thinking, knowledge and projections or predictions, all that is simply a part of responsible thought. But, of course, now we have science for profit, knowledge for profit, and a very shoddy proof. When I compare, for instance, Chinese medicine, where things have been tested and tried for literally 10,000 years, there is an empiricism there, and now we have you know, laboratory tests and the time between so-called discovery and market application is shrinking as the impact 
of these new discoveries has the potential to affect all life on Earth. You know, for instance, genetic manipulation. The, the issue there, again, it seems to me, is the acceptance of a limit. If science that accepts limits, for instance, ecological limits, a kind yes. of science that in practice would do no harm to yes. an ecosystem or a human body is very different from the kind of science that is pursuing truth with a capital T and will do anything to make that discovery too frequently, too dishearteningly, turns out to be product development. Yes. And uh, the people then who make the discovery are incapable of controlling its application. The nuclear scientists who developed the atomic bomb, of course, are the, a very good example. But so are chemists who develop yes. toxic substances for a limited use that they have in view, but then turn it loose on the market and into the to the world so you develop a chemical to control weeds and crops and you ask only the question of whether or not the weeds are controlled you don't ask what happens when it runs off into the rivers which is again why there has to be this precautionary principle and as Rachel Carson reminded us but you know this enormous societal shift with the trade treaties and the globalizing economy, we started seeing how around the world what was happening was that giant multinational companies were getting more and more power over governments. And I know that you were a wonderful voice warning about those trade treaties too. We've seen these last 30 years, haven't we, the enormous damage that this power shift created of giving giant mobile banks and mobile corporations more and more power over government, particularly with the financial breakdown in 2008, it was so clear that we needed regulation, but it didn't happen. The uh, global economy is almost by definition not subject to regulation. Yes. And as I've thought of it in the last several years, it has seemed to me that we've had a global economy about 500 years, yeah. ever since the time of Columbus. And this has allowed us to think that if we don't have some necessity of life here, we can get it from somewhere else. And this excuses everything. This is the most damaging idea that we've ever had. And it's still with us, still current. And it still excuses local plunder and theft and enslavement. But it's a, an extreme fantasy or unreality, the idea that if we don't have it here, we can get it somewhere else. If we use it up here, we can get it somewhere else, that sort of thing. It's the stuff of fantasy. Finally, it's simply a falsehood. What's very frightening is that from this, uh, the centers of power in the w corporate world, there is a recognition that globalization is not working, but what they're talking about is the opposite of what you and I talk about, which is giant multinationals using robots to make washing machines in America instead of producing them in China. Well, this makes all the world a colony. Yes. I'm a rural American, and uh, moreover, a Kentuckian. Yes. And I know that I live in a state that has been a colony all my life, and probably mm. for, well, ever since the Civil War, at least. We're a coal-producing state. Some of our counties in this state are the richest in the world in their natural endowment. And the result of that is that they have the land now uh, virtually destroyed and some of the poorest people. This is the result of a limitless economy. The only uh, recourse that we have is to try to understand what we have here that's worth our keeping 
and then to discover ways to keep it. And that is to say that we that we have to have recourse to this movement, I guess you would call it, toward local economies. We should fulfill our needs and export the surplus. We should never export the necessities of our own lives. The test, really, the ultimate test is whether or not we live in beautiful places. Wherever ugliness has crept in, we have the first symptom of exploitation and exhaustion. And illness. You know, it's so interesting how the beauty and the health go together. Yeah, of course and how is. the ugliness is part of the sickness of the land and of people. If we have a loved one who is in ill health, we say, you don't look good. Yes. And by that, we mean that that some kind of ugliness has crept into your body. It isn't just beauty alone, but when we talk about health, we're also talking about happiness. You know, we're talking about inner psychological and spiritual well-being. And we're talking about care and nurturing of others and of yourself. So again, it's all connected, isn't it? And Wendell, you said... I guess what you call a movement towards local economies. Are you a bit resistant to using that not very attractive word <laughs> or notion of movement? Trying that to word do movement? movement. Yeah, towards <laughs> yes. local economies. Yes, I've, I wrote an essay once called In Distrust of Movements. My quarrel with movements, and the reason I use it in quotation marks, so to speak, is that they tend to be specialized. But there's a, a movement now about climate change, and it has become extremely specialized. And the actual solution to a problem like that is to have an economy that takes care of everything, an exactly. inclusive economy, not exactly. just an economy of money-making. So I'm always a little anxious about movements. They turn into fads in a way, and then they peter out because they're too specialized. And it's so frightening, isn't it, that in the climate movement, it's become specialized to the point of being destructive, particularly when you have talk of carbon trading and carbon offsets and we know what that means in the global economy. Our plea in Local Futures is for what we call big picture activism to support a shift from global to local and then we're looking at the multiple benefits of localizing is not just about specialization, but it's about this adaptation to diversity. And so I often say that localism is the ism that could end all isms because it has to entail this adaptation to diversity. And so we're talking about the opposite of movements that want to impose a standard solution or a standard anything. Any kind of monoculture yeah. is deadly. Yeah. Localism would cease to be a, an ism just as soon as the <laughs> local people went to work locally. One of the things that's wrong with these great movements is that they're not telling people to go home and go to work in good ways to improve things. They're yes. movements to bring pressure on political leaders. To that extent, it's something of a distraction from the real problems, which are all local. This is a point where you and I might differ, because I believe that we need and that it is possible to encourage resistance and renewal simultaneously. And what we mean by the resistance is, first of all, linking together locally to resist the advances of the global monoculture in it's all its destructive forms, but also to link up with other groups around the country and even around the world to ultimately have a return to some kind of democracy where people have a choice. Do they want to be replaced by robots? Do they want to be enslaved to send off the food they need for their own local economy? Or would they rather shift all the re regulations, taxes, and subsidies to support local economies worldwide? 
So in that sense, I do believe that at the same time as we start the work at home, we can also raise our voices to have a unified call to come back home. What do you say about that? Well, you're really asking me, Elena, if in addition to my insistence on the importance of a local context and local work, do I believe in policy changes? Of course I do. I have done a good bit of that work. Wes Jackson and his people at the Land Institute produced a farm policy called the 50-Year Farm Bill. And what that proposes essentially is converting our agriculture from an 80% dependence on annual crops and a 20% dependence on perennials to the opposite. And that change, which would be a policy change, would cure a lot of problems, including to a considerable extent the problem of global warming. That's a policy, and it's general. Uh, It would have to be applied, however, in different ways in different places. And that would call for a high degree of local knowledge and local intelligence. That is why we must have local knowledge to survive. And it's being killed off, of course, with the death of languages, which is concomitant with the death of species. As knowledge accumulates in place over a long-lived lifetime and over the successive lifetimes in families and communities, the local knowledge becomes almost instinctive. I've been so struck by how for us uprooted, urbanized, peoples who struggle to get back to the community and the land, how every decision is such a difficult one and there isn't that inherited and almost instinctive knowledge. We don't realize just how much we've lost and how much more we can still lose if we don't really understand the gift of that inherited local knowledge. We could actually have more time to do the things we enjoy, to sing and make music together, to actually enjoy life and the beauty around us. You know, we have a a vision to offer people that is really an invitation to a richer, more joyous life. Well, I think that's true. My publisher, Counterpoint Press, has just published a book called The Round of a Country Year, by my friend David Klein, who is an Amish bishop in Holmes County, Ohio. And Holmes County is a very fine exhibit because it's the largest Amish settlement in the country. And farm after farm is a small-scale Amish family farm. David's book, which is really a kind of journal of what he did day by day throughout the year, is remarkable for its happiness. Nobody is overworked because plenty of people are there. The scale is right. They've accepted certain limits. People are rarely in a hurry. It's one of the happiest books I've read in a long time. I would recommend that as an exhibit of exactly what you're talking about. Thank God that there are still some communities that are able to have exactly that ratio of people to the work, to the land, to the providing our basic needs. I saw that so clearly in Ladakh, how incredibly easy it was because there was plenty of people during the harvest, during building a house. It was done in such a leisurely way and with so much time for celebration and festivity as part of the work. A lot of it is traditional. They are extraordinarily skillful, and those things ease the hardships. I think the Amish, their success is really attributable to their ability to take, in an economic sense, the idea that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. If you love your neighbors yourself, you won't replace your neighbor with a machine 
Let's talk a bit more about that, the replacement with machinery. I mean, look at how we were promised with the computer, we were going to have this amazing new information society where there was no need for industry and we could all live in our lovely villages and just work a little bit on our computers. And let's look at what's happened now and what is likely to happen with this new wave of technology. Well, I think that that's suicidal. I think that's the operation of the death wish among us, that we don't any longer want to live the lives of our bodies, our physical lives. The idea that you can't exert yourself so far as to crank up your automobile window yeah. is absurd. But it's also the antipathy to the use of the body for anything except yeah. maybe sex. Yeah. And I suppose it won't be long till we'll have a robot that can do that for us. That'll be a very radical setback for us. Yes, yes. And to have already now apparently robots looking after old people, robots as surrogate children. I've already seen the difference between children having contact with and looking after their younger siblings and looking after living animals, you know, instead of stuffed toys. Uh, you need to have ways to enact your love. And that would be in caretaking for the children yes. and the old people. The putting yes. on of hands, that's the only way we can do it. We can't enact our love by hiring a robot to do it. And the same for the world. If we let machinery, whether it's a robot or not, intervene to too great an extent, between us and the farmland or the forest land that we're using, we begin to destroy it. We begin to destroy what economists would call the resource. And finally, yes. this has a very practical economic effect. One of the effects, of course, is disease. It's not being spelled out enough just how much cancer and heart disease and so on is on the increase. Many people don't realize that. They still keep believing, oh, it's just because we live longer. Wes Jackson recently sent me a sign that he'd taken from a motel in Colorado that said, if you are pregnant or nursing a child, don't drink this water. It has nothing oh. to do with longevity. This has something oh. to do with poison in the drinking water. I recently made an effort to find out why the native black willows have disappeared from my river. Yes. And in the process, I discovered that some scientists had discovered and published their discovery in a refereed journal. There's too much glyphosate, that's Roundup, in oh. Midwestern rivers. And I called a couple of those scientists, and I said, I see you found out that there's too much glyphosate in Midwestern rivers. Oh, yes, they said there's far too much. I said, can you tell me what the effect of that is? And the answer was, a lot of people would like to know. This was because of the difficulty of attaching a cause to an effect in the world in general, but also especially in a large volume of moving water. So we know that the toxic chemicals are there. We're going to have a very hard time finding out what the effect is. But so there's a, pre a precautionary principle. And the precautionary principle says don't put poison in the water. And don't do anything where you have no idea what the effects are. Well, we and, don't know much uh, about the future. And that, uh, again cautions us to keep our work on a proper scale and not to do too much too quickly. Uh, Wes and I have talked at considerable length about the difference between behavior based on the assumption of our ignorance and behavior based on the assumption that we already know or soon will know everything we need to know. Exactly. A physicist friend of mine in Germany was saying what's so frightening is that modern science, he was saying particularly in biology, was so enamored of its ability to predict and of its modeling and, and so on because, as he said, they were operating within the sphere of the man-made world. 
in real terms, in understanding life, you know, how a seed matures, how our bodies function. The ignorance is, of course, still enormous. Now the next step to move into a world of not just robots, but 3D printing, driverless cars, which again, of course, are robots. It's very frightening that people are so locked into the man-made world. And they will tell us, Wendell, that we're utopian, that we're we're not being realistic. For them, (laughs) the real world is this commercial man-made world. Well, it's a strange utopia that depends on people being absolutely passive. And again, it seems to me to do with the death wish, which is also the same thing as addiction. Addiction is manifested by much more than dependence on a drug. We have children, young people, dying from drug addiction. Here, in rural America, in my little corner of it, uh, the addiction to drugs is receiving some attention. But the young people are also addicted to computers, and nobody's concerned about that. But again, that addiction to the screen removes the person physically from the life of the world. So it it does seem to me to be deathly, suicidal, absolutely ruinous. Did you know that there are also, in some places, there are clinics where they take screen-addicted youth, and they, I don't know if they have them in America, but I know they have them in South Korea. That's very profitable, of course, and means that this really helps economic growth. If you can make money by selling an addictive device and then make money by curing people of their addiction, that's a great business plan. (laughs) <laughs> Very good. Just like lots of cancer and chemotherapy are also nicely adding to GDP. Yes, that's right. <laughs> it all depends on unhappiness, sickness, ill health, and the rest of it, ugliness. But isn't it remarkable that so many environmentalists you know, should be joining us to just laugh at the notion of GDP You know, once you look at the fact that GDP increases with breakdown, why aren't we all linking hands to demand this fundamental shift in the economy? One of the roots of the problem is the focus of environmentalists or the conservation movement for 100 years has, at least in this country, focused on wilderness preservation places of spectacular rocks and waterfalls at the expense of what I would call the economic landscapes, farming, forestry, and mining. The politicians have kept the environmental movement quiet by designating wilderness areas. In the meantime, they've let the corporations run completely out of control and extraordinarily destructively in the economic landscapes without any acknowledgement at all that the natural world is out there just the same as it is in the park. And, of course, at the same time, what I find so inspiring is that in what I call the localization movement, in small steps, communities around the world are rebuilding truly healthy homes or or economies by diversifying and those are like little diamonds in the landscape aren't they of beauty of those are the examples we need to study and look to and always that localization depends on a revival of the neighborhood principle people can only do this if they help each other and these accounts come in my mail how farmers for instance, have scaled back, diversified, and increased the number of people who are employed on the land. And this, it seems to me, is the incontrovertible answer to these people who say we need to give up on human nature and as a favor to nature commit suicide. And also such an important point is that small diversified farms 
can always produce more per unit of land and water and energy than large monocultures. So we have to turn this lie really around where people believe we are too many people now to localize. We're too many people to have small farms. They make economic sense, uh, but they also produce more happiness, more beauty, more health. Yes. Those yes. things that are yeah. not quite so quantifiable. Yeah. And more thriving opportunities for wildness as well within the yes. farm. That's counterintuitive, maybe a paradox, yes. but the more boundaries yes. you have, well, say in the farming landscapes, the more the land is divided by fence rows, the more bushes you have. These act as wildlife corridors and, and habitats. Can we talk a little bit about what you have to say when people ask you as an American about Trump and the people who voted for Trump? Well, there's far too much generalization now about rural America. Yes. Conservatives and the corporations have had their eye on rural America all along, and they've been turning it into money as fast as they can, which is to say destroying the land and the people. The liberals and Democrats have discovered rural America now, a place about as far into them as it was to Columbus. They don't know anything about it. And they've been condemning it out of hand, as if everybody out here in rural America is a racist, sexist, backward, ignorant person. And this yes. isn't true. The problem is that rural America has been a colony, yes. certainly throughout my lifetime. I don't think anybody has paid attention to rural America since about, oh, 1945 or 50 Certainly not since 1952, when Eisenhower's Secretary of Agriculture said to the farmers, get big or get out. They've just abandoned rural America to the corporations and the technologies. And now, if they would only look out here and try to learn what's here and the really terrible predicament we're in, they yes. might be able to construct a policy platform that would be meaningful and would give people a real choice. People voted for yeah. Trump not just because they liked him, but because they saw no hope. They didn't feel that they could count on the other side. A friend of mine wrote me, a minister, who said the Trump voters' grandfathers were priced out of farming. Their parents experienced a generation of union-supported good wages. And this present generation, the grandchildren, don't have anything to depend yeah. on or look yeah. forward to. That's a, a bad situation for people to be in and to expect yeah. an enlightened choice yeah. of people in that kind of trouble may be asking too much. Especially when there is no enlightened uh, offer. If there was an enlightened alternative, the scene would yeah. be different. But I don't think any presidential candidate had a clue about the existence of rural America, much less the problems that it has. It's so frightening because throughout the world, you know, in, in a more obvious and visible way, in places like China, India, and most of Africa, you're seeing farmers being pulled and pushed off the land. They're told that rural life and that they are there backward and primitive and if they yeah. want to be respected they've got to move into the city and then by the million they're pouring into the city whether in their own country or trying to go to another country yeah. in the hope of getting a job and then the jobs are not available and of course you're getting the angry reactions that in many cases translate into into local ethnic friction and then into an anger and hatred against the West and terrorism. So this breakdown of our really genuine local economies connected to the land in the name of progress, in the name of efficiency, we are now you know, at a point, as you know, where more than half of the global population has been urbanized 
but we do have an opportunity to to say let's push the pause button on this juggernaut that's pulling people away from real livelihoods and then start a journey back to the land. All people don't have to live on the land, but we need cities that have some relationship with the land around them and that have some breathing space within them so that we regain that contact with nature and with the real source of our livelihoods, with the real economy. We need people on the land capable of acting as a sort of lobby to defend it, but also to use it well. These terrible problems that you're talking about come about because a depreciation of the humanity of these people has been necessary to their exploitation, to their use as colonials and colonies. Uh, If you're going to steal from somebody, uh, you need to convince yourself that they're inferior, and then you have to convince them that they're inferior. I've heard too many farmers stand up at meetings and and start to speak by saying, I'm just a farmer and I don't know much. It's false and a terrible tragedy and depreciation that they've convinced themselves that this is true. And of course, in the West now, what is it? Is it one and a half percent in the U.S. still farming? It's less than one. Uh, oh, but yes, the Census Bureau, you know, ceased a number of years ago to count farmers. But you have to say almost nobody. And yeah. very few of the people who are still farming are making their living entirely from farming. They're yeah. working in town. Their spouses are working in town. Something else is being done to support yeah. what you'd have to think of as their love for farming. Yeah. If they didn't love it, yeah. they wouldn't do it. Recently, I was invited to be part of a brainstorming session and with a a climate activists and wonderful, well-intentioned people. And over three days out of a group of 20, I was the only one who referred to food and farming. And then when the third time I tried to bring it up, you know, they said, well, I don't want to farm. And then, you know, the message was, well, I don't want to be a farmer, therefore farming is not important. I, I think the only thing that's required is that if you're interested in food and you're, it's a legitimate interest, you have to be willing to follow it out as it branches into our economic life. We yes. don't need everybody on the farm, God forbid. That's but right. we do need support from the city, and the, the mm. use of the land needs to be much better staffed than it is. So it's going to take a long time to get this done. But yeah. we need to help it yeah. along. But, you know, Wendell, there too is where I really believe in this resistance and renewal message, because I believe that the resistance part would demand policy change from a, a people's movement. I just, last night I gave a talk at Schumacher College and there was someone who pointed out that David Corton had written in one of his books, he'd sort of had a long list of what over 70% of Americans agreed on. I think we all care about, you know, our community, our family, our friends, about our health. We want a healthy climate and a healthy world in in the political theater we have today, none of these things are being addressed properly. Well, I think you uh, and I are are speaking from a kind of agrarianism. This has nothing to do with the left and the right. This simply says that the land, the given world, is of some value, of ultimate value, and that the caretaking of it is a matter of the utmost importance, paramount importance. Yes. And to argue from those two points puts you outside the current political dialogue. But yes. there are more and more people who do understand that. The county governments and city governments are coming to understand that. I don't think in, in America state governments and the national government can understand it at all. But the county judge executive in my county would understand our conversation just perfectly this morning. The governor of the state would think we were speaking a foreign language. (laughs) 
But isn't this so interesting? Because this is again a pattern that is quite logical, which is that at the level of the local council, the leaders are responding to the realities on the ground, to what people are needing and what the land needs. But then when you go up to that higher level, they're off in their own utopian, make-believe world of numbers and, and statistics. But as you say, there is a waking up. I see awareness trickling upward. And it's very encouraging, I think, particularly when we know how pressured people have been and how suppressed from media, government, funding, you know, it's not been there to support this agrarian no. movement and this new farmers movement, but also to see a lot of young people now wanting to farm. Isn't that the most inspiring thing of all? Yes, uh, it's inspiring that they want to. It's much more inspiring when they try it and yes. are able to keep at it for, say, five yes. years. Because there's a great difference between wanting to and doing it, between doing it and surviving at it. Exactly. Now, there are some young people here who, from an urban background, have gone, have taken up farming. And some of them are doing admirably. But with difficulty and that needs to be said but as it trickles up we just have to make sure that it trickles up from things that actually work from yes. real knowledge uh, down yes. here at the bottom what we do in our organization is to encourage people to really understand this global techno-economic monoculture so that they can be much more wise and sophisticated as they start these projects. For instance, in South Korea, my book, Ancient Futures, was a bestseller, and it, you know, it sold about half a million copies, and I've been told that it led to quite a movement back to the land among young people. But it was only in later years that I've been able to work with them and and really make sure they've understood that I was saying they need a community. And that means don't go off and just think it's only about producing something on the land. If you're trying to live off the land, try to expand the number of people who are doing it with you. But it's particularly this understanding that we, we need basically a community, as you said. The great weapon that in the industrial food system has used against farmers is surplus production. And the farmers will inevitably overproduce. There's yes. no way to stop it without some kind of organization, some yeah. kind of policy yeah. at some level. There are two reasons for overproduction. One is hope and the other is despair. For whatever reason, they produce all they can. This deprives yeah. them of what people here might call an asking price. When yes. they go to town with their produce, do they have a price that they can demand? And the answer is that over the long history of agriculture, farmers have very rarely had an asking price. They have simply carried their produce to the market and accepted whatever they were offered. And that's where the enlightenment of the agricultural population has to begin with that question. Have you ever had an asking price? The great example we have here of the right response to that is the tobacco program as it was uh, organized here in my part of the country. It's too bad that it was tobacco because it carries that stigma, but it would work for any product. But the program said, we will give you this much, and it was a livable income based on the principle of parity. Mm -hmm. But we will only protect this much. You can only bring this much. So it, it combined price supports with production control. And that's what you have to do. Otherwise, farmers will just produce themselves into bankruptcy. That is to say, they'll 
succeed themselves into failure. And yeah. it gets worse as they give up their subsistence economies. For me, that also the word that's better for that is the diversified local economy. And of course, all of that infrastructure and those kinds of technologies that could be useful for yeah. that much more diversified, healthy economy have been either destroyed or marginalized or never even invented. You know, there's still such a scope, isn't well, there, for genuinely appropriate technologies. Value-adding industries to the products of the land don't have yeah. to be as big as a, an airplane factory. We have now a very good small slaughter facility here in our county, and uh, this opens up lots of opportunities. My daughter is trying to set up a beef co-op here, and it would be then processed here and oh, otherwise it goes out of the community without adding much to the benefit of the community if our trees leave this community uh, as raw logs or rough lumber the community doesn't benefit much i see how in industrial society the system has driven up the price of labor human labor and artificially lowered the price of energy and technology and in through that encourage every single enterprise to use more energy and technology and throw yeah. more people on the rubbish heap and you know if that could be shifted we would have a completely different world and economy a cheap food policy is a disaster but we got to be be careful in saying yeah. that food is too cheap from the standpoint yes. of the producers, the primary producers. Yeah. Still, from the standpoint of poor consumers, it's too high. So yeah. it's a complex yeah. matter, and we oughtn't, to, we oughtn't to oversimplify. No, but I think, Wendell, again, for us, it's pretty clear that the so-called cheap food is incredibly expensive because That's of all right. the energy and the chemicals and the, the number of people involved in the food chain doing useless, poisonous, destructive things like driving trucks across the country and then putting the stuff in huge container ships that then, or even worse, in airplanes. And then at the end, you know, this long-distance, processed, rather toxic food is offered at a lower price. And in the meanwhile, the reality of what can happen when you shorten distances, you reconnect, you reduce the, the energy consumption and the packaging and the waste and the refrigeration, and you provide healthy food, and you have healthy, happy farming communities. I was born into a way of farming that used solar energy, and I yes. haven't forgotten yes. it. We had these solar converters called mules and human <laughs> beings. Yes. That's the way yes. we got the work done. Well, thank you so much, Wendell. I shouldn't take more of your time, but maybe we can do another conversation sometime. Wendell? Well, this, yeah. this, had, this hadn't been too bad. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. No, Helena, this has been a pleasure and really has worked me hard in a good way, and uh, it's been valuable. You can find some links related to the topics discussed in this episode in the episode description on localfutures.org. There you can also subscribe to this podcast and listen to or download other episodes. If you liked this episode, please share it with your friends and communities. We're always looking to reach a bigger audience. And write to us if you have ideas for other people or topics we should feature on the podcast. Our email address is in the description. Thanks for listening to Local Bites.